Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So this is the four-hour chart of silver, and we're watching this correction uh, happen and trying to gauge how serious of a correction we have here. So I've drawn a, a number of lines in. Of course, this one here is the primary trend line, and you can see that we're nowhere near coming back to that, although we could. Uh, the next important line here is this support line. This, this support line here is where we would expect to correct back to. You can see if we draw a line back from essentially where the last breakout occurred um, back over here, you can see that the correction came back right here to the old highs. So that would bring us back to this point and we're not near there. We're actually uh, falling in the pennant. It is a falling pennant, but it, it's a strong one. So if we look at the MACD, you can see that the, the MACD has, at least on the four hour chart, has fully reset uh, back down to there, which really only rivals this and this. So based on the rising market MACD pennant principle uh, with the buy signal here and, and the market taking off there. Uh, same thing here and here. Uh, same thing here and here. You can see that the, the, the bull market signals are valid. They're working. So if this bull market continues, we would expect this signal right here to be valid. And that's going to be a breakout of this line and then a resumption of the bull market. Is that necessarily going to happen? No. But that's what we, we would expect if we have truly rolled over into a bull phase. Now, when we pull out to the daily, uh, we do have a pretty oversold MACD. You can see it's one of the highest uh, pr uh, numbers we've seen at 0.80 uh, for however far this chart goes back. The only other one we have here was on the way down here in 2013. So that's a pretty serious spike and it may take more time than uh, we would initially expect to work that off. Um, but if we get back down near the zero line then we could, we could resume. So we'll wait and see. Then of course the major outlier whether it's well we'll go back to the old bull market, uh, you know, the major outlier is one of these things. And when you get a rise like that, um, any pullback is a buy because uh, it's just a, a blow off type of situation that very well could happen. You can see we're still negative. Believe it or not, we're still negative on the monthly on the MACD. So let's jump over and look at this question from Da Vinci on the member site. Uh, th this is a tough question for me to answer because it it assumes a lot. So I'm I'm just going to try to delve into it and and examine the issues involved. Uh, the question is, brother John, if can you do a video on why assets that are liquid and not purchased with debt, like homes and cars, will go up in value after the collapse? Actually, I'm wondering if you know why not, because I don't. I think it's an important subject to discuss with the viewers. So hopefully I'm understanding the question. It's a bit confusing here. Um, right now, these assets, homes and cars, are purchased with debt. It's actually a completely distended and distorted market because of the debt involved. Uh, just to show you as an example here, you have an article here on Keystone Auto Loans here where you can see that there are actually 10-year auto loans, 120-month 10-year auto loans. And you can see at a 4.5% APR, you can have a monthly payment of $210 at, at, on a $20,000 loan. So uh, these already exist and the strategy for a debt-based system where 
the buying power of the public is weakening is to extend the debt out further. Now that also applies to mortgages and you can see here's an article talking about how the 50-year mortgage debuted in California and uh, I believe in Japan they actually have had as high as 60 to 100 year mortgages, multi-generational mortgages and uh, that was back in the 80s but I think some of those still exist. So the other factor you have to think about here is do you have an asset that is going to last that long? Do you have a car that's going to last 10 years? I think a good car is going to last 10 years. Uh, but what are you going to have when you're done paying off your loan? Nothing, really. Is, is, are the houses that they're building right now, are they going to last 50 years without major repairs? I don't know. Some of the stuff they're throwing up now, I would be surprised if it lasted 50 years. So back to the question what happens after the collapse because I think that's pretty much the basis of da Vinci's question is after the collapse are these things going to be purchased with the uh, are they going to be purchased with cash well that's a very hard question because that presumes that we know what type of system we're going to have now I personally believe that the bankers if they have their druthers and get what they want they're going to go directly from one debt based fiat system to another so i would expect that we would probably see a reset of the system back to a debt based system we probably see a compression in the timeline uh, the length of the loans but then again it would gradually expand back out Am I expecting to see a situation where you can buy a house for silver? Possibly that could happen. But right now we're looking at a situation where it appears that, I don't know if you've noticed, this is just an anecdotal thing, but if you, at least where I travel, you see used car lots or recently new car lots. I see car lots popping up everywhere. And I definitely have to wonder what is behind that. I think the government... Uh, just a kind of gut instinct is that the Obama administration is pumping up the economy by making it very easy to open uh, car lots and to get car loans. They're, they're trying to pump this thing up into the election. And that's my guess as to what's behind that. But definitely they want to keep the system going. Uh, the GM bankruptcy was a big... Uh, important factor in this because the government took over that company and then the government started buying those vehicles so it's a very incestuous thing it's hard to determine what the real market is and I suspect that it's going to be very hard to determine what the real market is after the collapse now if housing completely collapses and there are no buyers because the banks aren't willing to loan then I would expect that you would see very very low prices on on those houses those uh, existing houses but as to what new houses will be I, I don't know now in regards to automobiles I think you could see the same thing you would see very very low prices on uh, used automobiles and but what's going to happen with new automobiles how are they going to be able to sell those um, I'm, I'm right now in a position where I need to buy another car but when I look at what's out there and what I can get I'm talking about I'm looking at maybe fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars for a, a bottom of the line uh, economy car and then I'm looking at anywhere up to thirty thousand dollars for a, a decent car and that's ridiculous to me I, I that's obscenely expensive especially when I look at the stories about the cars that aren't allowed in the United States because of phony bogus admission controls and things like that and I I simply can't pull the trigger on buying a new car right now I, I would probably if my car died right now I'd probably buy a used car I would be tempted to do that
So I honestly can't answer this question and tell you what I think is going to happen because I don't know if after this collapse of the current debt system that we have, which obviously they're trying to extend out by having 10-year auto loans and 50-year uh, mortgages, what the next system is going to look like or what the interim process is going to look like. We may see an opportunity to convert good assets like silver and gold or Bitcoin and things like that for cheap housing, used cars and housing, but it might be a very small window. I just don't know. It's very hard to say. It's going to be very exciting. Get your popcorn and we'll watch it unfold. So I want to take you over to the Perth Mint Lunar Series pricing and uh, listing on AppMax. The reason why I was uh, looking at uh, picks and what I thought would be good buys, I always go look at the Lunars first. I check AppMax, Gainesville, Provident, Jam Bullion. But uh, as a default, the AppMax site listed the coins by popularity. And so I decided to do a video based on how they uh, sell these and how popular they are. Now, I have no idea what this metric is. You can see when we look at the drop down that AppMex tells you that you can list them by these categories. You can choose most popular, low to high price, high to low, weight, year, highest rated. So when we choose this most popular coin, I'm going to assume that this is the number of coins sold. Now it might not be the number of coins sold. It might actually be the number of dollars sold. And that has to do with the size of the coin. Or it might have to do with the number of ounces sold. And I don't know what the window is. I don't know what the time frame is. Is it this year? Did it start in January? Is it a clock that ticks from January 1st to January 1st of the next year? Or is it something that's adjusted weekly, monthly? I have I don't have the answer to any of these questions. All I know is that Atmex is listing these coins and saying that these are the most popular. Now I'm I'm just gonna go down the list here and comment on this because I find this kind of interesting. The first one that comes up here that Atmex says is the, their most popular coin is the one ounce lunar monkey, which they're asking $39 a coin. That is double the silver price. They're actually asking double the silver price for this. Supposedly, uh, it's it's a, supposed to be a bullion coin. This is not a collector's coin. This is supposed to be a Australian bullion coin. But you can see that it's selling for twice the silver price. And it is, according to Atmax, their most popular. So keep that in mind. If it's true that this is what people are buying, that is... Uh, that's interesting information. Now, the next one here is the colorized coin. And the first thing that's going to shock you is that this is this is the Monkey King. So I don't know what that is, uh, but it is a strange looking design. I'll say that. Uh, it definitely is not the Monkey colorized. It's something else. But it's a good $10 cheaper than the uh, one ounce Monkey. Uh, then we have the half ounce monkey, that's the third most popular. And we have the half ounce monkey colorized, that's the fourth. And then we have the one ounce colorized. Now you can see this is the straight one ounce lunar monkey coin here, colorized at $29.70, is nearly $10 cheaper than the non colorized. And I've talked at length before about why colorized coins lag the real coin. I think it has to do with silver purists and um, the way they think about being able to see the design and and all that. Now here's an interesting one here is the two ounce lunar monkey at $56. Now that's not super cheap. Um, I mean that's $28 an ounce but that's not bad. So that's an interesting one, maybe one you want to think about buying. 
The next one surprising to me is that the five ounce colorized monkey, uh, this Lunar King thing, it's on sale. I don't have any interest in five ounce coins, so I don't care. Now, you can see this half ounce Lunar Horse lagging severely the half ounce, uh, the regular half ounce horse, and, uh, horse, and that, that's the same pattern there that we see that the colorized really lag the uh, the straight up coin. Here's the 2016 one ounce lunar monkey um, with a lion privy and you can see that the even the lion privy coin is about eight bucks cheaper than the standard lunar monkey. That's unusual, you don't see that. And then we have the kilo. Here's the two ounce horse it's a little spendy at 60 bucks. I think I got mine for 42, but uh, it's still fairly reasonable. Uh, next, uh, here's this Monkey King again. Here we have the half ounce Lunar Horse at 40, or I'm sorry, the one ounce Lunar Horse at 40 bucks. I think I got mine for 37. I only bought about 20 of those. So not a big uh, return on that. And then uh, the last one I wanted to look at here is the uh, well let me point out here here's the dragon the 2012 one ounce dragon I think I got mine the cheapest I ever got those was 30 or 40 35 to 40 bucks those are the coins that came out at $99 and they really were reluctant to lower them down so you can see they're holding their value and uh, but the one I wanted to look at here this is my favorite this is one I bought a ton of here and you can see here's the 2010 uh, one ounce silver tiger now this is not that high on the list but it's fairly high it's probably 25th or 26 something like that uh, and it's $89 for this tiger coin the one ounce tiger so uh, that would indicate to me that these valuable coins are going to continue to increase in value we've got a nineteen dollar and sixty cent silver price and people are paying remember this is popular that means people are buying it people are paying ninety dollars for this coin people are paying four and a half times the spot price for this coin and so that tells me that this pattern is going to continue into the future uh, the ones that are valuable and wanted are going to expand more than the spot price does and uh, they're just going to continue to go up and we'll talk to you next time.